Dear colleagues, dear students, it is an immense pleasure for me today to welcome our honored guest from the Australian National University, Professor Dr. Christopher Allen Gregory, or to his many friends simply, Chris. At the invitation of the Frobenius Institute, Professor Gregory has agreed to deliver this year's Jensen Memorial Lecture Series. This series is dedicated to Adolf Eligard Jensen, who together with Leo Frobenius was one of the most prominent representatives of an anthropological approach called cultural morphology. In 1940, the Nazis deprived Jensen of his Venia Legendi, but six years later, the University of Frankfurt created a chair of ethnology and turned him into the first full professor of this discipline in Frankfurt. He became the new director of the Frobenius Institute as well as Frankfurt's Museum of Ethnology. For almost 20 years, Jensen exerted influence on anthropological studies in Germany and beyond. Yet the approach of this school of culture history was increasingly criticized and more and more replaced by new theoretical developments originating mainly in Great Britain and France. Our memorial lecture here is meant to provide an opportunity to internationally renowned scholars to reflect on the history of our discipline and to engage with previous ideas and research topics from a fresh and contemporary perspective. One theme that Jensen dealt with throughout his scholarly life is the relationship between myth, ritual, and knowledge. Jensen is particularly renowned for his interpretation of the so-called Dema gods and the high novelle myth of Sera, which he relates to the origins of plant agriculture, plant cultivation, and sacrifice. How relevant are such myths about agriculture today and how can a contemporary anthropologist use such myth to say something about current scholarly debates? Last year, when I was planning this memorial lecture together with my predecessor and colleague, Karl-Heinz Kohl, it suddenly came to my mind that I indeed know an internationally renowned scholar who not only studies myth and ritual, but also engages in contemporary discussions about the place of anthropology in the globalized world. It must be due to some divine blessing, maybe Lakshmi, that the person I was thinking of is here today, Professor Chris Gregory. Within no time, Chris Gregory came up with the most suitable topic for this lecture series, a topic that is clearly related to Jensen's fascination for the relation between myth and agriculture. Chris Gregory wrote to Karl-Heinz Kohl and me, I quote, the offer to lecture on myth and ritual is a very timely one for me because for the past 20 years, I have been working on the translation and analysis of 31,000 line oral epic sung by Halbi speaking woman for, um, about the Hindu goddess Lakshmi that is ritually enacted as rice harvest time every year. These lectures, he says, will give me the opportunity to locate the epic in its broader comparative and historical context and to draw out some of its more general theoretical implications." Unquote. He entitled this lecture series, The Pursuit of Wealth and Happiness, Some Lessons from Central India. And this title already points to some of the key issues Chris Gregory has been dealing with in more than 40 years of his academic career. 
The expression pursuit of wealth reminds one of Chris Gregory's continued interest in economic phenomena. He actually started his academic life as a student of economics who received a Bachelor of Commerce from the University of New South Wales and a Master of Economics from the Australian National University. With this background, he got an employment at the University of Papua New Guinea in Port Moresby, where he taught classical political economy, but also spent his time traveling through the country. These experiences turned him into an anthropologist, as he explains in the preface to the first edition of his book, Gifts and Commodities. I quote him, I was completely bewildered by what I saw. What little faith I had in the explanatory powers of orthodox economic theory was lost completely. In an attempt to comprehend what was happening to the country, I was led inevitably to the rich ethnographic literature on PNG, Papua New Guinea, and eventually to the theories of such anthropologists as Morgan, Moos, Levi-Strauss, and so on. In 1976, he entered the University of Cambridge, a place where at that time some of the most renowned anthropologists of the 20th century, such as Jack Goody and Edmund Leach, began to exert their intellectual influence on the young Australian scholar. His anthropological inquiries culminated into a doctoral thesis that was published in 1982 with the title Gifts and Commodities, a book that started an academic controversy which continues until today. This book must be, along with Moore's Essay sur le don, one of the most cited works on gift exchange ever. As far as I can see, almost every major contribution on this topic published afterwards contains a discussion of Gregory's main conceptual distinction between inalienable gifts and alienable commodities. In her highly influential book entitled The Gender of the Gift, Marilyn Strathern acknowledges Chris Gregory's impact on her own thinking when she writes, I quote her, the contrast sustained in this book between commodity systems and gift systems is taken directly from Gregory's work, unquote. Only recently, the editors of the journal How initiated the publication of the second edition of Gifts and Commodities. James Carrier, himself a leading economic anthropologist, applauds the reappearance of this work, arguing that, I quote, it is a useful reminder of the strength of more systematic approaches and of the ways that they can help us to make sense of a range of phenomena and a range of societies." Unquote. In the years following the publication of the first edition of Gifts and Commodities, Chris Gregory established himself as one of the key thinkers in economic anthropology by engaging in sometimes heated debates about exchange systems, consumption and production, householding, neoclassical theory, and the culturalist approach of Arjun Apadurai. From his writings, one senses his deep respect for, but also critical engagement with the grand theories of Karl Marx, Marcel Mauss, Karl Polanyi, or Claude Lévi-Strauss. What Gregory writes in How about Louis Dumont, the grand seigneur, grand seigneur of Indian studies, illustrates well his approach to theoretical debates. I quote Chris. Dismissing Dumont's work, he writes, is easy, but critiquing it in the old-fashioned sense of criticism, modification, and transcendence is an altogether different matter. To dismiss is to ridicule with arrogance, but to critique is to dignify from a position of humility. What remarkable and mindful words. In 1997, his second major book appeared, this time dealing with rural marketing systems in Basta in India. 
While the move from Bas Papua to Basta may seem involve a major change of perspective, Chris Gregory argues that, I quote, Basta district is to India what the Trobriand is to PNG, in that it lies in a remote, out of the way place, albeit in the center of India. This second book is entitled Savage Money, and despite its title, does not deal with primitive forms of money. Savage money, on the contrary, refers to the spread of what he calls disorganized capitalism or Nixon's wild dollar. David Graeber, in his famous book, Debt, the First 5,000 Years, pays tribute to Chris Gregory when acknowledging that his analysis of Nixon's policy, who abolished the gold standard in 1971, was directly inspired by Chris Gregory's ideas as developed in Savage Money. Let me, at the end, to turn towards the second part of the title of his lecture series. Gregory's second theme, The Pursuit of Happiness, alludes to another red thread that runs through his work. My above statements may have given the impression that he is mainly or even solely a specialist of economic anthropology. Everybody familiar with his writings knows that this is not the case. Even in his early writings, Gregory never simply concentrated on material exchanges and provisioning alone, but inquired into kinship phenomena, ritual practices, and moral dimensions of life. To me, the word happiness in his title points to his larger interest in values and morality, his critique of systems of loan and debt, his discussions of systems of inequality and capitalist exploitation. There is a deeply humanist approach in Chris Gregory's writings which locates the value creation process in human consciousness. As he himself explains, with a critical sideswipe to Apadurai, I quote, human valuers are the means by which values exist. Who are the valuers Chris Gregory deals with in his work? In the last 20 years, his research focused on songs and rituals performed by Halbi speaking women of Basta, in particular those concerning the rice goddess Lakshmi. By giving a voice to these women, in his writings and the lecture series which starts today, Chris Gregory offers his, his contribution to what has in other contexts been called subaltern history. He has been, I think, deeply influenced by the writings of Ranajit Guha, especially by Guha's fundamental critique of anthropologist's ahistorical comparative method and by his deep concern with the native's point of view. Like, Greg, uh, like Guha, Gregory is interested in the, as he calls it, nitty gritty uh, of anthro ethnographic work. And similar to Johannes Fabian, he affirms the co presence of conflicting forms of consciousness. Gregory is also concerned with the look from above, with a broader picture, with historically informed comparisons. We therefore, I think, all benefit from having a scholar as our guest who joins ethnography with theory, who combines the song of an Indian lady with the ideas of world famous thinkers. In a published tribute to Guha's 90th birthday, Gregory writes about his regular meetings with this doyen of subaltern studies. I quote, he had in me, Chris Gregory says, a raw young scholar who was not only prepared to listen, but felt incredibly privileged to be able to do so, unquote. I'm personally not so young anymore, but this sentence equally describes my feelings towards Chris Gregory and his presence here today. Thank you very much for coming to Frankfurt, Chris, and welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Professor Hardenberg, for your very generous words of introduction. 
Uh, it is a very great honour for me to be asked to deliver the Ensign Lectures for 2017, and I'm deeply grateful to the Frobenius Institute for this kind invitation. I must begin with an apology, and this is the fact that this lecture will be in my mother tongue and not yours. And I'm deeply grateful for your kindness and patience in this regard. The invitation to give these lectures arrived just as I was nearing the completion of the sixth and final translation of this central Indian epic called Lakshmi Jaga. This 31,000 line epic, which is sung by Halbi speaking women called Guru Mai, learned mothers, is a central Indian variation on the all India story of Lakshmi, the Hindu goddess of wealth and good fortune. Lakshmi is the personification of rice on the Buster Plateau of central India, and her epic tale is ritually enacted at harvest time each year, October, November. On the final day of the ritual, priests and priestesses go to the rice field to symbolically harvest a decorated sheath of rice representing luxury in order to celebrate her wedding. On their return from the fields, they take the longest distance possible so they can pass all the houses of the neighbourhood so that housewives can pay their respects to Lakshmi in this form here at the top right, um, that, that corner, <laughs> um, so they can pay their respects to Lakshmi and welcome her into their homes. People believe that Lakshmi brings wealth and happiness when she dwells in your home. But Lakshmi is a fickle goddess. She leaves if she finds social discord and vice. When this happens, her place is taken by her elder sister, Alakshmi, the goddess of poverty and misery. Alakshmi is a personification of millet in Buster, a drought-resistant grain that enables people to survive when the rains don't come. If one desires wealth, here understood in the fourfold sense of progeny, material wealth, fame, and a long life, then one has to lead a virtuous life. No jealousy, no laziness, no greediness, and no wife bashing. This is a, sung by women, this tale. <laughs> the avoidance of this and other vices must be complemented by regular worship of Lakshmi. Only then will Lakshmi dwell in your house. And, egalitarian goddess that she is, she cares not whether you're a Brahmin or a sweeper, high caste or low. At first, I was hesitant about accepting the invitation because I couldn't think what I was going to talk about for six hours. <laughs> and when I read that the subject of this lecture is usually centred on Professor Jensen's research interest, myth and ritual, it immediately became apparent to me that not only was this a great honour, but it also gave me the chance to organise my thoughts, as Roland said, on a topic I've been working on for the past two decades. But this realisation created a new problem for me. The singing of the epic takes some 36 hours over an 11-day period, and my public lectures that to take just six hours over six weeks. <laughs> Given that it took Guru Mai some 10 hours to give me a summary version of the epic, how am I going to give my summary of it, to situate the, in it, the text in its ethnographic context, to speak of its general theoretical significance in comparative and historical context, all in the space of a mere six hours? I can imagine Guru Mai Sukdai saying, they have given you an impossible task. <laughs> and... <coughs> and What's interesting, when the, the Guru Mai start singing this epic, they appeal to the goddess Saraswati, the goddess of wisdom and learning for guidance, and beg to be forgiven for their errors and omissions. Hail, O Mother Saraswati, goes the first line. Give me the wisdom of a guru, O Queen. Reside in my throat. Let nothing be left out. Fill my mouth, O Mother. Help me complete my song, O Saraswati. In like manner, I appeal to the wisdom of our academic ancestors and ask to be forgiven for my errors and omissions as I read my lectures. 
Given that I'm giving the Jensen Lectures in the Frobenius Institute at the Goethe University, it seems prudent that my appeal should be to those intellectual spirits who inhabit the hallowed halls of this distinguished establishment. Firstly, to Jensen, in whose memory these lectures honour. Secondly, to his guru, Frobenius, the founder of the School of Cultural Morphology. And thirdly, to Goethe, whose scientific study of plant morphology, the coiner of the word morphology, and the poet who reminds us that sacred poetry and botany constitute a complementary whole. Now, academic interest in Jensen's work has faded since 1965, when the publication of the English translation of his book, was called Myth and Culture Among Primitive Peoples, provoked a lively controversy in the pages of current anthropology. We academics are not renowned for our intellectual generosity. In our eagerness to embrace current fashions, we have the tendency to dismiss the thinkers of yesteryear rather than to critically develop their key findings in the light of new ethnographic work. When reading the scholar of the past, it is too easy to find assumptions and propositions that one disagrees with and to dismiss their contribution on these grounds. But, and Roland has stolen some of my words, dismissal is not critique and neither is uncritical celebration. To critique is to dignify and we show our respects to our elders by critique understood as criticism, modification and transcendence in the light of new data. I would like to show my respect to the memory of Professor Jensen by focusing on some assumptions that I agree with rather than those I disagree with. <laughs> and using these to help me to organise my own material on the Lakshmi Jaga epic. Indeed, it is one of the unexpected pleasures of this, inv this invitation that uh, has given me the chance to discover his work. The reason his work excited so much interest in the 1960s and the reason it is still discussed in some circles today and will continue to be discussed tomorrow is it's because it's based on in theories and empirical findings solidly grounded in ethnographic research that have been situated in their broader historical and geographical context. This approach enabled him to explore the relationship between the cultural specificity of his ethnographic findings and their general theoretical significance. Just as the airline pilot needs one view from 10,000 metres and an altogether different view when they're about to land, so too is it with an anthropologist like Jensen as he wanders around the rainforests in a remote settlement of eastern Indonesia one year and thinks about the global theoretical significance of his findings here in Frankfurt in later years. Mythical perceptions, notes Jensen, contain statements about those spheres of reality for which there are no alternate scientific explanations, I'm quoting now, the mortality of living things, the miracle of reproduction, the necessity for food, the common fate man shares with beast and plant, in short, on the mystery of life. Once created, he goes on to say, each religious form has its, like every other cultural phenomena, has its own history. It acquires a function in the cultural framework and is usually bound up with special goals. And having become a venerated tradition, does not need to retain its original meaning to continue. For Jensen, then, religious cultural forms are answers to fundamental questions about human existence. It follows that history offers us a profusion of questions posed and answered. Its study requires an approach that looks at the cultural history and the cultural geography of specific religious ideas. He sees this as a quest for understanding in Dilthi sense rather than in explanation in the natural scientist sense. This intellectual agenda anticipates Geertz's interpretive approach to anthropology, but the concept of cultural morphology and Jensen's stress on the importance of understanding the, the symbolic importance of food glands, such as grains and tubers, this will be a theme which comes out today, is part of a long tradition of German thought that takes us back via Frobenius to Goethe 
any scientific study of the morphology of plants. Plant foods like rice and tubers, Jensen correctly notes, not only fill the belly, but they provide food for intellectual thought. <coughs> um, and as only a moment's reflection illustrates. Holy Communion in the Christian Church, for example, employs the symbolism of bread. But if we are able to understand the, religious, the religions of people in Africa, Asia and the Pacific, we must understand the symbolism of staple foods such as rice, yams, taros and sweet potatoes. This means we must study <clears throat> the morphology of plants because the imagination of sacred poets is everywhere informed by a deep understanding of botany. They spend their lives nurturing them and watching them grow day by day. Myth is not science, but one must understand botany, zoology, ecology, if we want to understand the poets of Busta and other places in the non-European world. This was the fundamental message of Levi Strauss as his classic four-volume study of the myths of the American Indians reveals. Interestingly, his inspiration was Goethe. In the essay on his scope of anthropology, Levi Strauss quotes two lines from Goethe's poem on the metamorphosis of plants. Quote, all forms are similar and none is like all others, so that the chorus points the way to a hidden wall, hidden law. The arising and passing away of plants bears a close resemblance to the arising of pa passing away of people and cultures. And this likeness has been exploited by poets from all times and in all places. Goethe's pioneering scientific work on the life cycle of plants was informed by his quest of the primordial plant. Frobenius' theory of cultural morphology has its remote origins in Goethe's classic study of the morphology of plants. The chorus that points the way to a hidden law in Fabrinius' theory, as I understand it, it is what is called Paideuma, a concept that lives on in the journal of this institute. A prime concern of Jensen and Frobenius was to critique Eurocentric thought about non-European cultures by showing how myths and rituals in parts of Africa were informed by a, power, a, 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 a a poetic imagination grounded in the, the consumption of food, um, food crops such as tubes and, and millet. Jensen's theory of sacrifice, for example, advances the argument that it arose in root crop cultures. To understand the cultural morphology of this fundamental idea, he argues, we need to situate ethnographic data on, quote, the native point of view of root crop cultures in, in cultivators in a deep comparative and historical context. This involves developing an interpretation that transcends the localism of the native point of view, because this, he argues, is a pseudo explanation. Now, the novelty of this approach is that it involves a critique of ethnocentrism wherever it be found, be it in Europe, Africa, Asia, or the Pacific. In other words, we should seek not only to understand the native point of view, but also to critique it. Now, the merits of this approach struck, <coughs> struck me last December when I made a short field trip back to Kundagaum, the town in Basta, where my field work was based and where Gurimai Sukdai lives. In the previous year, a culturally sensitive senior administrative officer decided to host a public performance of the Lakshmi Jaga epic as she was keen to preserve this wonderful oral tradition. She was advised it would be a good idea if they brought singers from a village 60 kilometers south because their version of the epic was different from the local one. This would give the locals a chance to hear a version they had never heard before. But when I asked Guribai Sukdai what she thought of this performance, she was full of disdain. Their story is all mixed up and wrong, she said. And, and so were all their melodies. Achanihe, no good, complete rubbish. <laughs> so herein lies the merits, I think, of the anthropologist of comparative method. We're not concerned to judge a myth or ritual right or wrong, but rather to grasp how the variations fit together in order to develop an understanding that transcends the local. 
For my part, I have found this wrong version to be crucial in helping you understand Guru Mai's right version. And we'll see what is something like a classic Levi Straussian mirror image of the other. Well, let's have a glass of water. Now, at its most general level, Jensen's theory of religion focuses on the opposition between tubers and cereals, between root crops like taro, sweet potatoes and cassava on the one hand, and cereals like rice, wheat, barley, maize and millet on the other. This opposition is the basis for two generic mythical themes that he and Frobenius discovered in their extensive ethnographic, archaeological and historical research in different places throughout the world. He called these two themes the Prometheus mythologime and the Hainu Weli mythologime. The first general theme, as the name Prometheus would suggest, is centred on Europe, but it's found in grain-producing regions in part of Africa and Asia as well. Like all good moral tales, this mythical theme is founded on a vice, the theft of grains in this case. The Hainuweli mythology takes its name from a figure in a myth he collected in 1937 when working with the Waimeli people in eastern Indonesia. Just as the myth of Prometheus is taken as an exemplar of a general theme based on, on theft, so this Waimeli theft, uh, myth exemplifies a generic myth about a goddess who was beheaded and reborn in the form of hubers that provide uh, food for humanity. Now the reason I found this theory of interest it was because it enabled me to situate the Lakshmi Jaga epic in its broader historical context. The South Asian myths about Lakshmi and her reincarnation Sita are classic examples of this Prometheus uh, mythic theme and they are all variations on the general theme of the theft of grain. Strictly speaking, they're about the abduction of wives. But these are two ways of saying the same thing because in English we say things are stolen and people are abducted. And in any case, here, rice is a, is a woman. So <clears throat> now the Buster story of her life is a highly localised uh, story of her abduction and it's a variation on the classic tale of Sita's abduction in the all-Indian myth of Ramayana. Now, Sita is not a rice goddess, but her name is a Sanskrit word that translates as furrow, because a farmer found her in a furrow when he was planting. Now, there are many variations of these myths, and in Basta, there is an interesting variation, which I will tell you in forthcoming lectures. For the present purposes, it suffices to note that the deep history of agrarian transition on the Buster Plateau has been from root crops to millets and from millets to rice, a process of transformation that is still going on today. The archaeological and ethnographic evidence establishes this beyond any doubt. Now, what is extraordinary about this 31,000 line tale is that it's an allegorical restatement of this deep historical process of agrarian transition. In other words, an extended metaphor, and which gives this story this amazing narrative unity. Another fact about this epic, all these long Indian epics about men killing men. In this epic, no one gets killed. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Now, the history of the relationship between um, um, grain and root crops is everywhere different, a function of the cultural geography of the region in question. Jensen worked in many parts of the world, but his fieldwork in eastern Indonesia was located on, oops, on the eastern boundary of monsoon Asia. My fieldwork, by contrast, was centred on the western boundary of monsoon Asia. And from the perspective of cultural morphology, these two places could not be more different. And it is important to grasp this difference if we are to understand the epic. One way to describe the boundaries of monsoon Asia is in terms of wet rice production. 
Rice is a very thirsty crop that requires lots of water. And it also requires distinct wet and dry seasons in order to grow. It is planted at the beginning of the wet season and harvested at the end. The history of agrarian transition in monsoon Asia is incredibly complex. It tells one story if one takes a big picture perspective of the geographer, another if one takes the ant's eye view of the archaeologist. But as I suggested before, with the pilot analogy, we need to keep both in mind. <clears throat> From the geographer's perspective, the, the big picture is clear. This is on the eastern boundary. Root crops, tubers, and were around first. Rice, an aquatic plant, comes next. It is an imperialist crop that conquers the best lowing lands and works its way up the mountain in terrace sleeps, steps and quite literally marginalises millets and takes over the wetter areas favoured by tuba and taro. Spencer's research on the historical geography of Southeast Asia illustrates the moving frontier of rice's colonisation of monsoon Asia over the last 500 years, as we can see. Um, archaeologists have established that China is an origin site for rice, from whence it has moved westward towards India and eastward towards the Pacific. The eastward retreat of root crop frontier now defines a boundary that separates Indonesia and Melanesia. In eastern Indonesia, where Jensen works, we find a frontier zone where grains and tubers coexist. But from Melanesia onwards, we find uh, root crops only. Indeed, I know of no place in Melanesia where grain of any sort is produced, and not even millets. And development agencies have tried to introduce it, but they've all failed. The western frontier where I work is radically different. Here there's been a doubled movement. First millet has replaced tubers, and rice is replacing millet or coexisting with it. The story of wheat adds a further complication, which I will address in Lecture 5. For the moment, it suffices to note that wheat is a cold season crop that complements rather than competes with rice, which is a wet season crop. So the millets are both wet season crops and there's a competition. And this competition is enacted out in the ritual and in all the, the mythology and allegory. Monsoon Asia divides India into a relatively dry west and a relatively wet east and coastal south, which is roughly that line. This provides a natural barrier to the expansion of rice, but one, I should say, that has been breached in recent times by new canal irrigation systems. The Buster Plateau lies on this frontier zone between the wetter east and the drier west. But unlike the eastern boundary of monsoon Asia, the staple on the other side is, not, is grain in the form of willet, millet and wheat, not uh, rot root crops. And so here we've got world rice production. So you, you can see that takes us all the way across to Europe. And if we see the worldwide millet production, it gets a bit more complicated <laughs> in, 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 in Central Asia, and I'll come look at that next week. But basically, um, from the rice-centric perspective of the singers of the epic, the relatively dry east uh, is the land of Alakshmi, of millets, of poverty and misery. The relatively wet east, by contrast, is the land of Lakshmi, of rice, of wealth and happiness. And it is highly significant that the richest source of epic literature about Lakshmi is found in the wet eastern zone of India. You'll find very, very few stories of Lakshmi uh, in the, the dry west. And the Buster Plateau abounds in epics about ex Lakshmi. And as one descends the hills to a, of Orissa to the coastline, we find another extremely rich mythical and ritual tradition. But this is one where Brahmin priests have appropriated the women's oral traditions and turned them into written texts which reflect the moral point of view of men. <clears throat> what this uh, is a Rissian text retain, though, is the idea of Lakshmi's egalitarian, radically egalitarian values. 
as evidenced by the fact, as I said before, that she is prepared to dwell in any household regardless of the caste of the householder. Lakshmi's moral concern is with virtue, not purity, with equality, not hierarchy. As such, the existence of these epics of this kind calls into question generally accepted theories about Indian society and culture. So I'll have to strip off a bit. <laughs> Thank you. Now, the cultural and historical geography of Buster requires us to revise Jensen's theory by introducing a lower level distinction between wet grain, that is to say rice, and dry grains, wheats, millets, and so on. As I said, from a Buster-centric perspective, the world of food is divided into three zones. We have the, well, oops, sorry. I went, oops, what's happened here? Uh, that's it. So, yeah, so the world, I won't try and play around again. The world of food is divided into three zones. The millet and wheat eaters to the west, the rice eaters of monsoon Asia, and the tuber eaters of the Pacific. Now, food is only one way to get a handle on a cultural region. One must look at other aspects of culture, such as language, religion, kinship, among others, none of which overlap exactly, and to the contrary, in India, they crisscross. And I'd like to think of this crisscrossing of cultural domains as a defining characteristic of any frontier zone. The Buster Plateau, for its part, is right at the centre of a crossroads that divides India roughly east-west in terms of food and roughly north-south in terms of language and kinship. The east is relatively wet and hence suitable for rice. The west is relatively dry and suitable for the cultivations of millets and wheat. Southerners speak a Dravidian language and allow for cross-cousin marriage. Northerners speak Indo-Aryan languages and forbid cross-cousin marriage. The culture of the people from Buster then is a complex hybrid and, um, and their kinship, for example, has what the linguists call an Indo-Aryan lexicon that are Dravidian semantics, which is to say they use northern kinship terms but in a southerner way. <laughs> and uh, for those who hang around the last lecture, we'll get into the nitty-gritty of kinship because we'll see that all of these factors are influencing how women think and their imagination. Now, unlike the cultural anthropologist for whom this north-south dichotomy is the primary division, the people of Buster stress the primacy of this east-west dichotomy, because this is the axis that separates rice from millet, wealth from poverty, happiness from misery. Now, to understand the general associations that Frobenius and Jensen found between staple foods and sacred property, poetry, is absolutely necessary to study in detail the botany of the life cycle of the plant in question. By doing this, we can appreciate both the significance of the contribution of someone like Goethe and also his limitations. Consider his method for studying the metamorphosis of plants. I quote, if I look at the created object and inquire into its creation and follow this process back as far as I can, I will find a series of steps. At first, I will tend to think in terms of steps, but nature leaves no gaps. And thus, in the end, I will have to see this progression of uninterrupted activity as a whole. Now, this figure shows a summary sketch of his primordial plant for which he searched unsuccessfully. It can be seen that the life cycle of a plant begins with a seed and ends with a seed. The seed grows a stem that produces first leaves, then flowers that have both male and female parts. The bees and the wind help transfer the pollen from male part to the female part and results in the development of a fruit that contains seed. The seed is then scattered around by birds and the wind and finally falls to the ground and the process begins again. Goethe's genius was to see that this movement from seed to seed was a movement from leaf to leaf, because a seed, he said, is nothing more than a leaf in contracted form. 
The, the life cycle of a plant is a process of metamorphosis of the leaf as it expands and contracts. Thus the flower is a leaf in its fully expanded form. This contracts to form the male and female parts, expands to form a fruit. The fruit is pregnant with a seed, which is a leaf in its most contracted form. And this analysis, based upon close scientific observation, enabled him to declare that everything is leaf. Uh, I'll let you, I won't try and <laughs> say Alice Blatt, is that right? <laughs> um, this theory of plant morphology still has its basis in botanical science today, although botanists fault his seven-stage theory, which clearly has its origins in the theories of alchemists that uh, Goethe, was a, Goethe was attracted to, as Roland Gray study shows. In the place, quote, of alienation of, from the natural world at the centre of the conventional uh, Cartesian approach, Miller argues, Goethe proposed a way of identification as a path to a deeper unifying knowledge of nature. Goethe embodied his belief that science and poetry with their corresponding conceptions of nature are not incompatible, but actually complementary. Botanical science may, uh, may find this approach problematic, but not sacred poets like Guru Mahasuk Day, who spend months every year weeding rice and singing songs about it. Their imaginative constructs are not constrained by the scientific method. Their sacred poetry, to repeat Jensen's observations, contains statements about those spheres of reality for which no scientific explanations. Now, the, the sacred poets of Buster who sing Lakshmi's song are not scientists in the conventional sense, but because they spend so much time watching rice grow as they weed, they become experts on the botany, the botany of rice plant morphology. I found that I had to spend the wet season watching rice grow if I was to able to understand the language of this epic. Like the Inuit of the Arctic Circle who have thousands of words for snow, the Guru Mais of Buster have thousands of words for rice as its leaves go through the stages of metamorphosis that Goethe describes in his classic study. Just as Goethe moves between the language of science and the language of poetry when, writing, when moving from writing about his scientific study to writing a poem about it, the women of Basta also have a dual language, describing the growth of life, the rife plant, at every stage. It's the most extraordinary rich lexicon. For example, the flowering stage is called Dan Julisse, or Dan Pulisse, I should say. And they also describe it as Lakshmi Julisse. The first expression, Dan Pulisse, is comprehensible to a botanist, and it translates literally as rice is flowering. But the second, Lakshmi swinging, Lakshmi Julisse, is a poetic rendition of the same two hour period in the life cycle of a rice plant. And um, the, uh, as poets, they liking the swaying of the male and female parts of the plant, the stamens and the stigma, to the swinging of a husband and wife on a swing built for two. <coughs> to grasp this image, we must understand the cultural significance of swinging in India. Whereas swinging in Europe is something children do for fun, Swinging in India is something that goddesses and goddesses do for the very serious purpose of sexual reproduction. This much is very explicit in the Lakshmi Jaga epic. When the Rhine comes to abduct his new bride, Lakshmi, he finds her swinging. The, the relevant lines from the epic could not be more explicit. I quote, he stops the swing, the king stops the swing. The king sits on the swing. The king takes the queen in his lap. He makes love to the queen. So it's absolutely clear. Now, one of the marks, of course, of a great thinger is their theories have limits. And um, they pr propose theories of something, not theories of everything. And it's, it's a task of us, less mortals, to identify these limits and to provide new ethnographic evidence that enables understanding to inch forward. In Goethe's case, 
A root crop cultivator would find his study of plant morphology very wheat-centric <laughs> because he only deals with plants that reproduce sexually. There exists a whole class of plants that reproduce asexually and tubers are chief among these. It's only when we examine the life cycle of a tuber that we can see how quote-unquote obvious is the underlying logic of the root crop beheading theme. With asexual reproduction, only one plant is involved and the offspring is genetically identical to the parent. Cutting is the most common form of reproduction. The head of the parent is removed and then planted and the new plant grows from a clone. While tubers can reproduce by a flower in the wild, human intervention requires uh, this cutting and beheading. And as this slide for taro cultivation shows, the mature plant is beheaded at harvest time. The roots are taken home for eating and the head is replanted. Roots establish themselves, the leaves grow and new tubers form. Once we know these facts of botany, it becomes of no surprise to find that the, polyps, the poets who survive on root crops find a likeness between the cycle of reproduction and blood sacrifice rituals where peoples and animals have their heads removed and given to the gods as offering. No doubt they also find other associations, such as the propensity for men everywhere to settle disputes by beheading opponents. This raises questions which goes beyond the theme of my lecture, and I should say in Buster we have both rituals of sacrifice and rituals uh, uh, of non-sacrifice or weddings. And, but there's a very strict division, sexual division of labour. The men engage in sacrifice, the women in epics like Lakshmi, which is my central theme. Now, it suffices to note too that the poetic imagination of the Waimali poets from whom Jensen got his two exemplars were formed by a very clear understanding of the scientific differences between the sexual reproduction of grain and the asexual reproduction of tubers. I now come to the implications of uh, Jensen's food-centric approach. The implications of, uh, his arg I would argue, of his <laughs> is not so much Eurocentric, but rather wheat-centric. And I, I must say, I'll say this is a statement of fact, not a negative valuation, and I absolutely, as a wheat eater, I'm absolutely delighted to be in Germany, which of course is the paradise for all wheat eaters. So thank you very much for inviting me here. <laughs> Bread has been the staple in Europe for millennia and one needs to ask the question of how much this has fed our thoughts as well as our bodies. European conceptions for wealth, for example, have been shaped by the political economists and as Professor Hardenberg says, I've read something of these people. The political economists in the 18th century and 19th century such as Canet in France, Smith and Ricardo in Europe, and Karl Marx, of course, in Germany. References to wheat production and bread consumption abound in these works, who seem blissfully unaware that the general models of capitalist reproduction they develop are based upon the culturally specific economics of wheat production and wheat consumption. Wheat is a dry grain crop with a very low yield relative uh, to the rice grown in monsoon Asia. The productivity is measured by the ratio of number of seeds sown to seeds harvested. This seal to yield ratio, as it is called. In early modern Europe, the ratio was about one to five. One grain planted, five yield. In late imperial China, the, the ratio often exceeded one to 50. In other words, uh, wheat is the most extraordinary grass ever cultivated by Homo sapiens. And that the yield is 10 times that of Europe, which is why, of course, the population of monsoon Asia is 10 times that of the rest of the world and more. Furthermore, wheat, because of its botanical properties, requires capital intensive methods of production and consumption. Wheat must be threshed and ground into flour with machines and then baked in an oven to produce bread to be eaten. Rice, by contrast, can be harvested and threshed by hand and then thrown in a pot and boiled and one can get a meal in the fraction of the time it takes to, to have a baker loaf of bread. 
those of you who feel the need to test this theory should beware when you try and thresh wheat with your hands. Your, your hands will be turned to shredded because it's very, yeah, that's like uh, glass. Now, I will develop the implications of this particular argument in my third lecture where I explore the rice-centric view of the world that the Guru Mahas of Basta articulate as they struggle to survive and answer the big questions of the mystery of life. Like the political economists, these gurus too have a theory of value, but their theory is expressed in the form of the, an allegory that insists on the unity of economic, familial and theological values, not their separability. My name is not to show that these are better or worse, but simply different, and as such, to suggest this may help us think more clearly about our places in the world yesterday, today and tomorrow. Now, after this high-level travel across the world with Jensen as our pilot, we now approach India. As we descend, we are confronted with the phenomena of Lakshmi as one of the great goddesses, one of the three great goddesses of the Hindu pantheon. Jensen methods leads us to ask, what is the big question that Lakshmi answers? I think it is, what is wealth and how do we accumulate it in order to ensure happiness and long life. <clears throat> 